today. So today we have um, we have uh, Tim Eyes, who's from um, the central coast of New South Wales, to talk to the, us about um, regenerative agriculture, red meat from paddock to plate. So over to you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Good day, everyone. Yeah, uh, happy National Ag Day. I'm Tim Eyes, and uh, my partner and I have a farm called the Food Farm. And to be technically correct, we don't actually have a farm. So I'm a first generation farmer, and uh, it's something I've always wanted to do is be a farmer. And uh, I guess recently, over the last few years, found myself in what's being termed as regenerative agriculture. And uh, yeah, it's pretty a very exciting journey. A lot of change for me coming into regenerative agriculture from my conventional background. So uh, I live on the New South Wales Central Coast between Sydney and Newcastle. And we're not seen as a predominant sort of farming area, but definitely through its history, it has been renowned for its farmland. And uh, we, so I grew up here and I just always wanted to be on a farm and um, I've just worked my way through. So I went to boarding school and then after boarding school, I went to Tokau Ag College to, I guess, learn to be a farmer. And, uh, and then after Tokau, I got a scholarship and went over to the UK and saw that relatively small farms uh, could be profitable, could have a huge impact on uh, our food system. And so when I came back to Australia, I started my own business consulting and contracting to different farms. And at one stage I was working with 36 different properties and that was all in the, in the beef industry. So growing cattle uh, to process and then sell that beef to consumers. And we were uh, mainly so uh, growing cattle and vela calves that went to straight to butcher shops and then obviously straight to the consumer. And uh, my journey through that was very exciting and it was exciting to grow a business. And, and I think as a young person who doesn't quite know what they're doing, uh, growing your own business is, is just such a wonderful way to learn all sorts of skills in life. And so conventional agriculture and what's called regenerative agriculture are very different and uh, but also have incredibly big similarities and well as well as a farmer looking after our animals is the most important thing and also uh, probably as important as that is looking after our soil and the environment that we're farming so uh, I will introduce my friend here this is Joyce she's actually our house cow so she's a what we'd call a dual purpose cow uh, she could be processed for meat, but at the moment she's only just had a calf four days ago, and uh, so we actually milk her. And uh, but she's got a beef calf on her, so her calves will be processed and put through our business uh, directly, uh, marketing our beef to consumers. So, yeah, conventional agriculture uh, I found relied a lot on. Um, synthetic fertilizers and those sorts of things and that just really challenged how I wanted to be in life so recently over the last few years uh, we've transitioned out of that into regenerative agriculture which is a much more holistic way of thinking and uh, a very exciting place to be in as we look at climate change the role that ruminants have in climate change and uh, positive and the, I guess the, um, the misinformation around their negative impact on climate change. So regenerative agriculture is definitely focusing on bringing agriculture back to the natural sequence of life and the natural sequence of land management. And so moving those animals through uh, the land in a symbiotic relationship with each other. So that all can be a little bit um, confusing without seeing it, but what we see is in the past or when we look at uh, where our farming practices have come from, they uh, have come from Europe and it's very different, uh, Europe and Britain and very different farming areas. So we in Australia really need to look at how we can farm this land in its own 
certain way. And that's, uh, that's definitely fitting in really well with regenerative agriculture and keeping those stock moving. Because what we need to do to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil is grow immense amounts of grass because our root systems mimic the, uh, the plant that's on top of the ground and what's left in the ground after the grass is snapped off by the cows uh, is left there as carbon. So rewinding um, to, I guess, what's gotten me here was uh, having that um, contracting business and all those sorts of things. But coming from a first generation, well, as a first generation farmer, we don't have a property. So uh, my partner Hannah and I, we lease seven different farms and I also manage three farms still. And they're what sustain our business. So our business is comprised of um, beef direct marketed to consumers. It's delivered every single week. And we also do some farmer's markets. And uh, so that beef's, the cattle are taken to the abattoir every week. Then they come back to a butcher. Uh, they're cut up, they're packaged. And then um, yeah, we pick up that product from the certified butcher we put it into boxes with people who have online ordered online, and then uh, yeah, we send it off all around New South Wales. And so, for someone who doesn't have a farm, we don't have a mortgage. It's very exciting to you know be managing a few hundred acres of land uh, that otherwise would be wasted. And so, we're able to transform that and uh, make it productive land once again. In being an hour from Sydney, land costs are obviously astronomical, but there's so many opportunities for young people out there and connecting with people is definitely something that I love to do and uh, the business really revolves around that. So we, um, we like to get people onto the, <laughs> onto the properties and uh, show them what agriculture is all about. Uh, we don't dance around the fact that we do take lives um, I don't think we'll be processing Joyce here anytime soon. But, you know, these animals have got to be cared for and loved uh, throughout their time with us as farmers and we need, to, we need to really focus on what we want their life to be like and it also needs to be in the most natural way possible as well. So when livestock or when... When ruminants, say bison, for instance, used to roam around America and so on, they were in mobs of hundreds of thousands and they were being hunted by wolves. So, and then um, cattle in other countries and those sorts of things, as they've developed and evolved, they've been moving. And so the whole concept around regenerative ag and how we want to manage these cattle is to keep them moving through the paddock. So giving them lots of, um, this is ridiculous, uh, giving them small amounts of area but moving them every single day so that they're not degradating that land. So if they're stuck in a spot uh, and they eat that grass down and then they continue to eat it once it reshoots, uh, that's where we start degradating land. So we need to look at what we're managing and then change our managing practices to give them the best life and move forward. So connecting with our consumers, as I was saying before, is very, very important, very exciting thing to do. Getting people out to have a look at the cattle and make conscious decisions about what they're actually eating. There's no, uh, there's no dancing around the fact that people are becoming much more curious and conscious about the food they're eating, especially when it comes to red meat. But I think we've got a very exciting story to tell uh, about how sustainable and um, positive the impact of ruminants on the land can be. And so they're just part of our system. Uh, we do run a small chicken flock as well, and they help put nutrient into the ground because we are 1.2. Oh, I don't know if you just heard <laughs> Joyce burp then, but that burp is, uh, is definitely is her what's called bringing her cud up. She'll probably start chewing in a second. And so what happens there is she's bringing grass from her 
uh, the first chamber of her stomach. She's got four chambers of her stomach uh, back up into the back of her mouth and she'll start eating that grass again. And that burp is where the methane come from cattle. But what we need to remember is that that methane was only generated from grass. So it's a very short term cycle. She just burped then again. And so she's bringing more grass up into her mouth. And so it's a very short cycle. So that grass grows, it takes carbon out of the atmosphere, the cows eat it, they burp it out as they process it because they're a big fermentation tank. The reason why we can't process grass into meat is, uh, is because we don't have those four chambers of the stomach. So there's a big beer keg in there fermenting that grass and turning it into energy, which grows uh, this beautiful animal for us. And then in turn with steers and heifers that we process red meat. So that's the process, but it's very short compared to the impact we see when we bring uh, coal out of the ground. That took billions of years to get into the ground. And then when we dig it up and burn it, that's where we have troubles because it's going to take billions of years and pretty well the world to be reformed for that carbon to end up back into in the ground. Uh, so I guess one of the big things is with looking after these animals and having them in our lives is their life cycle. And so we've got our cows and cows are females that have had calves. Uh, before that, they're called heifers. Heifers are young females. And then we have bulls. And a bull can join about 50 cows a year each or in a joining time. So um, we join. So when we say join, we're putting the bulls in with the cows to get them pregnant. And the cow will be pregnant for about nine months. And uh, we leave the bulls in there with the cows for six weeks so that they can get two cycles and uh, those cows will hopefully get pregnant and then start growing those calves. They'll have one calf every year, and uh, after they're about, um, that's after they're about two years of age, they, they'll be calving. About two and a half years of age, they should have their first calf, and they'll, uh, yeah, they'll have that calf on them for around nine months. Uh, the calf will start eating grass at uh, three months of age and they're just mimicking the cow. Four months of age, they start eating a little bit more grass. Six months of age, they're pretty well only drinking milk for the fun of it and, uh, and it's, you know, obviously getting some good enzymes and help from mum and uh, from the cow and then... At about nine months, we uh, do a process called weaning the calf. And uh, so when you guys, anyone at school, when you finished year 12 and uh, you sent off to uh, uni, that's when your parents will be weaning you. Uh, so they won't be looking after you anymore. They'll be sending you off into your own little world and you'll have to fend for yourself, get a job or do whatever you've got to do. And so we do the same thing for the calves. They go into a paddock with themselves. Uh, they play up a little bit and uh, we grow them out to the size that we want. So when we're processing a cow or a steer, and when I talk about steers, they're bull calves that have been castrated. So if we let all the bulls just wander around with their testicles in, uh, they'd try and uh, join everything they could and we'd have no control over the genetics of our cattle. Genetics is something I'll get into in a little bit, but it's very important for us to uh, breed the cattle for the traits that we want. And so just like a Labradoodle, uh, you've got the beautiful traits of a Labrador and the traits of a Poodle and we end up with this wonderful hyperallergenic dog that doesn't make people sneeze or sniffle and uh, you also get the nice size and nice nature from having the, um, from having the Labrador. That's, that's my personal opinion anyway. And so we do the same thing with cattle. We'll use all sorts of different breeds because there's 58 breeds in Australia. Um, and we can use those different breeds to, uh, to do different things. So Joyce here, for instance, um, she's... Uh, half beef cow and then the rest of hers uh, actually at Illawarra 
and Illawarras were some of the first cattle bought to Australia. And so she she does produce a lot of milk. Uh, unlike most uh, other beef cattle, they produce uh, put a lot of energy into their milk and into beef. Whereas at the moment, because she's lactating, her calf's only a week old, um, we're taking a bit of milk for her. So that's her breeding that does that. It's completely genetics. It's not anything else that we give her. It's just the way she's made up. And so uh, we'll do that with our cattle as well. So we have a lot of Charolais cows, and Charolais are from Europe. So we've got European, British, and uh, and then also Boss Indicus cattle. So uh, we use a British animal and a European animal. So usually an Angus cross a Charolais, and then we cross an Angus back over them, and they're the calves that we'll process for our beef in um, for our beef uh, business and go straight to the customer with that. So we're trying to get an animal to about 550 kilos live weight and that gives us a carcass weight and we usually talk in carcass weight because that's the meat that we get back of around 300 kilos. So we lose about 50% of the animal during that processing side of things. So that's the coat, uh, the stomach, all of the organs, though we do get the organs back and we use them for some of our really uh, popular products because people are getting right into organ eating. Uh, liver, heart, uh, all those sorts of things are very good for you. And something we notice on the farm here is if a, uh, if a predator ever goes and eats an animal that's died or that they've killed, they always eat the organs first and humankind has definitely changed that. Uh, but we can see a huge movement of uh, people trying to eat more organ meat because it's so much more nutrient dense. It's the filter, it's the pump, uh, it's what uh, keeps these animals going and takes in all the goodness from their world that they've been living in. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to please put them up on the uh, on the chat box and keep me keep me accountable. Keep me moving along with what I, what you guys want me to talk about. Uh, it's really important that I, I get to interact with you and give you what you want today. So, yeah, those animals are around 600 kilos and then we'll process them and we get about half that back uh, and then they'll be cut up into um, steak. The trims will go into mints and sausages and uh, then we send that fresh product around New South Wales. And then uh, what we may do, we have a self-replacing herd and uh, that means that the heifers we keep and uh, we grow them out to then have um, and then, yeah, so we keep them and then that's our next generation of animals. So we need to change the bull so that we've got those different uh, genetics and that's incredibly, uh, incredibly important for us to keep changing those genetics and picking what we want out of an animal. And so a couple of things, I think she can see herself. Uh, she's uh, admiring herself. And uh, so some of the things we're looking at, obviously, as beef farmers is growing beef. So those animals need to be nice and uh, chunky. Beef is muscle. We want those animals to be able to eat grass, convert that into muscle, and, uh, and then also put fat on as well. Because when we're talking about a beef product, uh, it's incredibly important for it to have fat, especially when it's grass-fed fat. It's really, really good for you. Full of omega-3s, especially when it's uh, it's um, especially when it's uh, off green grass. There's uh, there's some beautiful benefits of the fat. So one of the great questions is, what's your favourite regenerative technique you have learnt? Uh, one that has surprised you. I like that. Um, it's probably our grazing management and it's something that we'll always have to be better at. But, you know, the way I was taught conventionally is definitely to rotate your cattle because you want to keep them moving from their, um, you know, away from their dung and the worms that can grow in that as well. And so there's rotational grazing, 
but then we've got time managed grazing and we use time managed grazing and that's all about understanding the plant because we're grazing plants we're not grazing paddocks and what we get uh, a little bit um, a little bit hung up on as farmers is calling you know a paddock a paddock and not thinking about the plants that are in the paddock so yeah having um, that mindset that we're looking at those plants and we're grazing those individual plants and uh, that's been really, really important and definitely changed the mindset. Another thing I think I love the mindset shift of for me with regenerative agriculture is uh, looking at weeds differently and not looking at them as weeds at all. Essentially, um, yeah, you know, we have all sorts of different elements and they're either in balance or out of balance in the soil. Uh, so from, you know, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, then we look at our pH balance as well. And usually we can do a free soil test of our soil by understanding why weeds are growing where they are in our paddock. So certain weeds grow in certain conditions and uh, once you start to understand that, you definitely start to hate weeds a lot less and you get to look at them, appreciate them and understand why they're there and then utilise them to improve, your, um, to improve your farms. So, yeah, it's pretty fun. Thanks for that question. Uh, my other question is how old were you when you got your first cow? I bought my first steer when I was 14 and that was for like a, a show. I don't know where all the schools are, but uh, the Sydney Royal Easter show, you'll take a steer there, uh, you'll feed it up, it'll go into a competition while it's alive and then it gets killed and then it gets judged when it's dead. So that was my first experience with um, having ruminants and doing that through school. But my first cow I bought when I was 16 and uh, I've actually still got her. She's, um, she's pretty awesome. Her name's Annette. And uh, we don't name all our cattle, by the way, just some of the really special ones. So, yeah, she's now, she's actually 15 years old now and she's still going really strong. So I'm not sure how many years she's got left in her. But, uh, yeah, that was my first cow. And I've also got... Um, I have six of her heifers left with me as well. So we've pretty well kept all her calves, all her female calves and grown them out to be a part of our herd. And keep those questions coming. It's great. Keep me prompted and moving along. Uh, so when we talk about leasing farms, we've got all sorts of different, uh, different properties and different sizes, around 250 uh, acres for Hannah and I that we lease. And uh, one of those is up to 80 acres and then the rest of them are smaller than that and spread all over the valley. So we've got two twin valleys where we live and uh, it's a lovely place to be an hour from Sydney. Um, so it's a really good question. Thank you, Scott. Um, Scott's question is, what issues do you think regenerative farming faces in being more widely adopted? Uh, and to be honest with you, I think um, science is going to be a really big part of regenerative agriculture being adopted. There is plenty of science out there that does support it. However, it's pretty hard to find and dig through it. So getting things... Uh, re-qualified and getting them out there in mainstream media, mainstream farming, and also in mainstream training centres. So this year we've seen the first regenerative degree come out, which is pretty um, pretty exciting to see. And I love this one also, Scott. Do you think the term regenerative ag is well enough defined or does it need more formalisation? And that's a really tough one. Um, in many ways, it's, I, I'm not sure how well it can be defined because regen is very different for, to a lot of people. For instance, for me, uh, it means no chemical usage whatsoever. And for other people, it means minimizing their chemical usage, uh, as, as much as they possibly can. 
And also regen um, for me is all about introducing livestock to a system because livestock are our natural recyclers. And that's pretty hard to do when you have 60,000 hectares of, uh, of just cropping area. So uh, I, I can see that there is definitely greenwashing around the term regenerative agriculture and it can be lost very, very easily. Uh, however, I think as, as long as we speak to our consumers openly, most of them can see through it pretty quickly by asking the right questions. And so I think as time to answer your question further, Scott, as we do define what um, regen is or as it is more widely adopted, we will define what regenerative agriculture is and that will be much more exciting for us. As any transition, any change in society, we're going to see a lot of people come in first, uh, a lot of people drop off and then there's going to be the other adopters that come in when things are really sitting well and uh, things have changed a lot. I think one of the other things with Regen and what's so exciting about it is that you, you, you're you not just one thing, although farmers do, you know, cattle farmers and mechanics and business people and all the rest of it, the other exciting thing is that you get to you get to look after other animals you get to look after your soil in a whole different aspect and looking at the life under your soil as well as the life above your soil so it's pretty exciting and i think it's a real watch this space sort of area of agriculture and we're going to see a lot of change in the next 10 years and it's just important for us as individuals to do what we do well and then i think the right change will happen we want to be really careful that we don't legislate things too quickly uh, because that legislation's incredibly hard to bring back uh, and change down the track once it's in. So I'm really happy with how things are, but I can also see the concerns for the industry as well. And I think you know, as a regenerative farmer, um, I, I try and focus on what I am doing well instead of focusing on what other people are doing in, in conventional agriculture because I think at the end of the day, the reason why agriculture is the way it is is from necessity and the way things have happened and, and some of our farming systems that uh, society is definitely challenging at the moment are here for a reason, whether they're the right reasons or not, that's, um, you know, that's sort of beyond the, besides the point. And so the best thing Regen can do is show that farmers are better off, they're, they're more well off mentally, physically, and then their land is more well off, their environments are well off from doing their transition, and then obviously their bank account as well. I think it's really, really important for everyone to remember that farmers are business people at the end of the day, and we do need to make sure that everybody's making a healthy profit and especially as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, um, we've seen a lot of talk about, uh, about workers on farms and, and if farmers can, you know, change their inputs and keep things much healthier in the bank account department, we're going to be able to pay people better. And I, I, we've just in start, started employing someone and it's so important for them to love what they do and be happy on the farm because they respect our animals and they respect our land so much more. So it's really good. Now, remember, there's no such thing as a silly question uh, and, or a too curly question. I love answering anything. So if you're online listening to us today, please jump in the chat box, ask anything you want, or if you need more clarification on what I've been talking about, please don't hesitate to, uh, to put anything in there. So where we're headed, I guess, is at the moment we're processing a steer a week, about 120 meat chickens a week, and we've got a 1,000 egg-laying chickens as well. One of the beautiful things about what we do and with our lease land is that our land is infinite. We get to travel anywhere. And so if we can refine our model well enough, I honestly think we could actually sell our farming system as a fertilizing system when it comes to um, when it comes to moving our poultry around farms and then followed by our cattle. 
I believe that our our positive impact on the land will be something that people will put their hand up to have us migrate over their property, which is really, really exciting. So yeah, moving forward for us, we want to get to about 100 cows. Uh, we've got 70 at the moment, and then we want to be processing 100 steers a year. And so we'll be drawing from those other farms that I work with, and uh, that'll be great to work with them because in tough times we want because we're closer to the consumer it's really important for us to um to share that profit that i spoke to you about before i think ag and farmers can be a little bit shy about making profit but at the end of the day we need to be good healthy uh business people so that we have a healthy society uh, making a profit and being greedy are really different so i've got another great question here what is the best way you think young people could get involved in a career in agriculture? Well, I think just starting and passion is absolutely priceless. I was once speaking to someone about farming and ag and, uh, and their property in particular and the differences of people that they've employed and, and you can learn any technical skill. It is, it's definitely possible, but one thing you won't learn is to be passionate and care. That's very, very hard to learn. It's from your heart. So you need to, if you've got a passion for ag, you need to put your hand up. You need to take good opportunities. Don't take every opportunity, but you need to take good opportunities. You need to get involved. Um, you know, take me for instance. It, it was all about going to boarding school for me or going to a school with a farm, getting really, really excited there looking after those animals, showing that I cared and learning everything I could. And then I went to ag college and uh, I did quite well there, which was exciting. And they, they taught me those technical skills. And then you go out there and you form your own way, your own thoughts of agriculture and uh, continue to grow from there. So that's really, really exciting way of doing it. And uh, that's what worked for me. I've got great friends that were generational farmers, they're fifth generation, and, uh, and they're out there having a go, changing their landscapes um, and working on their family farms, which I think is quite a remarkable thing, but it's definitely not the only way. And we see so many other business people are buying into agriculture and because they not necessarily they don't have the time to be farmers, they're looking for farmers to run their properties well. And so there's so many great opportunities for people to get out there and be on farms. And then also, I think people from urban backgrounds getting into agriculture have a great story to tell back to the people at home. Learning about how our food gets to the table is really important because the more we disconnect, the harder the truths are. Um, there's just, as I said before, there's no dancing, dancing around the fact that as farmers you do uh, you do get confronted by death a lot and it's something that is, um, is quite an important thing and I'm not sure that Western society is doing death all that well. And so one of the beauties of what we do is we're also connected to all those lives before that death and so it makes us respect taking those lives a whole lot more and, uh, and it's really, really exciting.